We'll start with Samuel calling in from Texas. Why do fundamentalists target evolution? Samuel, how are you doing today? Samuel, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Hey, Hello. there you are. Hello. Hi. Hello, uh, Forrest. I uh, just want to say real quick, I'm a huge fan of your content. I love your Reactoria series. Paul, uh, I've never heard you on this show before, but uh, very, very pleased. You, you guys both done a great uh, Thank job you. hosting us, but I did want to ask. Thank you so that, much. Um, out of all of the different theories that we have that like would explain the natural world without the need of a god, mm-hmm. why would the creationists go after the one that seems to be the most, or one of the most, uh, hard to disprove? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like they're kind of setting themselves up for failure. Well, yeah. as well, I just as someone who be, as that. someone who up until recently believed that evolution was evolution and actually garbage, uh, there's a few there's a few things. Um, first of all, a lot of theism, at least Christianity and, and some of the other Abrahamic religions, are based on the specialness of that God wants to have a personal relationship with us that we are special, and evolution, unlike those other things attacks specialness um and another yet another thing is that evolution if you don't understand it if you let someone describe it to you who doesn't believe it becomes is is entirely counterintuitive right um so when i was a creationist the question is if we evolve from monkeys why are there still monkeys made total sense because i didn't understand what evolution actually entailed or if you, you want to throw at you, like, dogs don't come from non-dogs. A lot of those slogans, if you don't understand what the theory of evolution posits, those things are more intuitive than the notion that, that small steps get you, get you a certain distance. So, um, again, other sciences like the age of the Earth or how far away stars are, or do the rock, does the rock order make sense given a flood? Those are all kind of boring. No, like those are nebulous and boring and seem distant. But do, am I an ape is a highly personal question to, to a theist because they feel like that makes them less special. And religion, Christianity is all about, I am so special that the God who created the vastness of space cares about what I had for lunch and cares about whether I'm, whether I'm doing okay and about my eternal soul and wants to spend eternity with me. And if you accept at that point that I am merely in their view, merely the, the latest in incarnation of life, then that specialness kind of goes away. So, from my perspective, at least, that was all that was part of it. Um, and so I don't know if Forrest has anything to add, but that's my personal experience on this. Uh, your mileage may vary. That, that is actually uh, like to the letter exactly where I was going to go with it. So it makes me very happy that you would say such a thing as I don't have a personal experience with it. But like that is what I've been confronted with most of the time is that, you know, these other exp- talks and talking about the universe and, and talking about the Big Bang and talking about the age of the Earth and all these things. All these things are just mathematics. All these things are just observation. All these things are just telescopes, whatever. But when you're talking about me, you're telling me that I'm just a lowly ape and I'm not this special, fancy, important guy. Um, and it really, you can look at, at analogs to this, not just talking about evolution, but look at like the discovery of fossils. You know, back in, I think it was the 16, late 1600s, you had uh, Niccolo Steno, who found they had these things called tongue stones. And Niccolo Steno was like, yo, these tongue stones look an awful lot like shark's teeth, only they're way bigger and we can't find these sharks anymore. And this was the first understanding that this might be something called a fossil. And that's indeed what it was. They were finding uh, uh, you know, megalodon teeth. Um, and there is like, so this, if this is the tooth of a shark that isn't around anymore, that's kind of crazy. How can we justify this? How can we explain this? Because at the time, people believed in what was called the great chain of being, 
which was a hierarchy of all matter and all life that we knew in the universe. And so you had rocks on the bottom and trees a little bit above that. And then the ground dwelling birds above that. And then the, uh, the ground dwelling animals. And then the birds were a little bit more cool. And then humans were the best animals in the whole world. We weren't even really animals. And then there was angels right above us. And then there was God. right, And we had this hierarchy of everything that we knew to exist. Um, and so this idea that there were actually things that we used to live a long time ago that don't live anymore was a very, very controversial idea. It took another uh, over 100 years past that for, you know, we had uh, uh, Buffon coming along trying to figure out, like, maybe there's actually this causal link here. And then we had people like Mary Annan going out and, like, finding all these plesiosaur fossils. And we had, like, big ske whole skeletons. Charles Darwin found lots of fossils. That's one of the things that led him to, like, coming up with the idea of, of natural selection is that, like, he actually found these extinct animals. It wasn't until Cuvier that he actually came up, like, uh, uh, George Cuvier was the one who said, maybe there's this thing called extinction. And that was the first time that that concept was actually seriously proposed, um, was that things could die entirely and not be around anymore. That was a radically world-changing idea because it flew in the face of this idea that everything was made exactly how it was, just like that, and never changed. And so when you add on this fact that not only is life changing, but also we are part of that. We are part of the animals. And not just that, we're part of these ones that throw poop all over each other. We're the crazy, you know, whatever they are. Um, you have this, this, this history over and over and over from the discovery of fossils to the agreement that humans are animals with, with, with people like um, uh, uh, Linnaeus um, up to Jane Goodall. Jane, at the time of Jane Goodall, we were man the tool maker. That's what was humans. Yeah, we were animals. Fine. Linnaeus was right. But we were the tool making animals. And that's what separated us from the rest of these things. And then Jane Goodall goes out and sees, hey, look, Jonathan Graybeard, the chimpanzee, just stripped all the, the leaves off a stick and used it to fish for termites. That's not just using the natural world. That is actually fashioning a tool. And she brings that back to Leakey. And Leakey says, well, we either need to redefine tool redefine man or accept chimpanzees as humans what are we gonna do um and that is just like the whole like history of this kind of science is knocking humans down off of the pedestal over and over and over and over and evolution is the absolute just end all beat all way to do that you're not that special you are just another animal and like the whole world is a part of you just as much as you're a part of it uh, and that's really, really hard for somebody to accept when they've been raised in a doctrine that teaches you that, like you know, Paul said, that you are the most special thing in the world and the whole universe was designed with you in mind. That's uh, pretty much the polar opposite of that whole dogma. Mm, I see. Uh, I, that's like, I think it's also like, I, oh man, come on. We, we, we got to get rid of the tier list of different animals. <laughs> I just think that's a, <laughs> that was pretty tight, bro. We got it was good when we had it. Dang it. We, we like the tier list, the tier list. But um, <laughs> and then I just had one more thing to bring up that you were talking yeah. about how uh, when you have you have this idea of like we're special in this certain way, and it's really hard for people to go against that. It's like I noticed yeah. I'm I'm in high school, but so I have like uh, in biology we're going over evolution, and me having you know, watched your Light of Evolution series and gotten really interested in that, how that whole field of science. Everybody do that. <laughs> that by the way. <laughs> but they didn't, uh, but they did, they, they really just didn't do a good job of going over the exact qualities of how it works. And it seemed like it was like you had just enough wiggle room to allow creationism in there. And I noticed that and it made me really frustrated that we have this whole They're beautiful understanding of the whole, like, of how life went on. Like, for example, throughout yeah. my biology course, they didn't even once mention abiogenesis, which is, like, one of the most amazing parts of evolution, in my opinion. But I just think nope. it's, like, this, this is the dominant Christian culture that makes it really hard to show people just how beautiful the universe is and how this constant struggle to keep ourselves above other beings is like, it's not right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Right? It, this is my it's the cause of a lot of problems. When you think that you're more important than everything else and you're more likely to exploit everything else. And then we have issues like we have today. Um, 
And like a couple of things. And number one, I apologize for regurgitating that whole thing about the discovery of fossils when that's in the light of evolution videos. Um, and also, uh -huh. so you got to hear that again. And also, you know, your experience with high school biology and not really teaching evolution properly or as, as well as it could be uh, is very common. Um, I frequently talk about, I think it was Penn State did a, a, a publication a, a couple of years ago where they surveyed high school biology teachers across America and they found that 28% of them, only 28% actually taught evolution in a manner that was consistent with the implementation of like the National Research Council recommendations for like how to teach the actual evidence for what evolution is and how it works. 28%. 13% of high school biology teachers in this survey um, actually like actively endorse creationism, either by like poo-pooing evolution, downplaying it, or like actually spending a significant amount of time trying to talk creationism up or put it in a positive light or like teaching the controversy, so to speak. And it was only that extra, that, 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 you know, whatever 70% or 60% that's left there. That was, you know, yeah, whatever that, that, small amount of people that that extra kind of wiggle room those were the uh the they called them the cautious 60 percent they never really endorsed evolution they didn't say anything negative about it either they either downplayed it or just ignored it or just kind of like tried to dance around it because they didn't want to usually they didn't want to get any backlash from parents um for for you know indoctrinating their children and all this stuff um so that's very very common is, is that 73% of the time high school in America is going to either teach you not evolution mm -hmm. or actively endorse creationism. And only 28% of the time are you actually going to get a proper education in what evolution is at a high school level. Um, so unfortunately common what you're talking about. And it's part of the reason why I do the things that I do, because that is robbing children of their education. And it's breeding the next generation of anti-vaxxers and flat earthers and creationists. Because you teach them that it's okay to just say, I don't understand this, therefore it's not real. And that's part, it goes back to your first question that you gave, right? Like, it's easy, it's easy for someone to not believe in evolution when they are not taught it correctly. So that makes it even easier. So you, you can actually do more mm -hmm. damage than good by teaching it wrong. And of course, no matter what the topic is, if the only version of an argument you have is from the people who are against it, you are definitely in a straw man situation and you shouldn't ever be battling a straw man. You need to battle the best version of argument. I don't care if it's creationism. I don't care if it's climate change, vaccines, any topic, political, doesn't matter. Don't, don't accept what, what an opponent of an idea tells you the idea is. That's just, that's a bad starting point in general. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's the thing you, you mentioned earlier on when you used to be a creationist, you thought, you know, why are there still monkeys was a good question. That was a coherent that's a question to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, honestly, when I talk about evolution with people, sometimes I like to ask that question to them because that way, if they, if, if they say like, I know, right, that's what I'm saying. Then I know <laughs> it's not their fault that they don't mm -hmm. believe in this. They have never actually been taught what evolution actually is. Right. If you think that's a hard hitting question. If you wonder, you know, how can random chance make something as complicated as an eyeball is an actual serious question. If you think, why do you have so much faith in Darwin is an actual serious question. Then this is not me being, you know, some elitist asshole. Nope. Like you don't actually know the actual first thing about what this science is. And therefore, you don't believe in it. And that's the problem. It's not that it doesn't make sense. It's that you never learn the very basics of it. So, like, if your teacher didn't teach it to you properly, ask them. Why are there still monkeys if humans right. gave them monkeys? And if they don't have an answer, go somewhere else for your science education. Go talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Write to a college professor or something. Like, uh, whatever you can do. You're going to have a bad time with that teacher. Exactly. Yeah, and I I I, w I was I stopped listening to that teacher whenever I mentioned the word abiogenesis, and she gave me a blank stare. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just really quick want to thank you guys. All the work you're doing at the ACA it really means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, me personally, uh, it's sort of shown me that I'm not the only atheist in existence, which is nice. <laughs> and uh, it's, Forrest, it's hard to remember uh, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Forrest, uh, I just want to also thank you for your content because you actually, I found the ACA through your content and your content is really cool. Oh, great. Keep up the good work. Uh, it was really great. Well, thank you so you much. Nice to meet you guys.
Uh, and it's a pleasure meeting you, you as guys well. Have a fantastic weekend. All right, bye, All right, man. Take care, Samuel. Thank you so much.